Scan your body and feel like from the top of your head till the toes. Your body is completely relaxed. And ready for meditation. But gently bring your attention to the heart where you feel the heart beat. And have a subtle thought that there is a source of divine light in your heart. And that this is pulling you inwards, attracting you. If you have those, just don't pay attention to them. Watch them go. And gently bring your attention back to the heart. Stay with that feeling until Daji comes so that you are ready to receive transmission and to experience heartfulness meditation. We will wait in silence till Daji comes on the screen and I will move to the side.
Namaste, everyone. My humble gratitude and special thanks to Madam Jayanti for inviting us, the members of Heartfulness, joining hands at Auroville, celebrating Pujya. Sri Arvindo's birth anniversary, 150th birth anniversary. Since childhood, we have been hearing his name, his contribution. As a student, I have always remembered him as one of the freedom fighters. Later on, when I grew and studied bit of philosophy also. The great names of Aravindo stands out along with Swami Vivekananda and many great personalities of that order. Their contribution in upliftment of humanity's consciousness is enormous. He dreamt of this world where the super consciousness, the super mind of God can descend and engulf each and every one and benefit from the super mind of God so that peace may prevail on its own, love and harmony may prevail on its own. It's a lofty dream to be fulfilled. And he hit the very head of the nail in the right spot. Many of us struggle with this idea of why are we here on this planet? What is the purpose of our existence? Many a times the answer comes doing our best. In each field, whatever we are, Maybe we are doctors, maybe you are IT professionals, maybe you are businessmen, you are homemaker, you are a farmer. Doing your task as best as possible. Anything less will always make your heart heavier, filled with guilt, not having reached your full potential. And that spoils the consciousness. Guilt is the biggest weight on our consciousness. When we read all this literature and when we contemplate on all this, one thing st stands out very strongly that our existence, as we see this life in the physical body, there is invisible mental body and often impalpable subtle body called the causal. Physical body, now fundamental question arises, can it evolve if the purpose of life is evolution? Can the body evolve? I may like to swim like a dolphin and fly like an eagle, but how many years, millions and millions of years it can take for me to fulfill my dream of flying or swimming like dolphin? I don't have millions of years at my disposal. The limited age frame that I have, I can only age and decay. So physical body definitely cannot evolve. It can only age. Next thing. Let's talk about the soul, the cause of our existence, whether you call it soul or whether you call it life force, but something keeps us going, whether you believe in God or not, whether you believe in soul or not, that is not the question. But one fundamental fact remains that there is something within me that keeps me alive. People call it Atman, soul. 
Many names are there. Science says it's a life force. So let's stick to that, whatever makes you happy. All our literature, ancient literature says, soul, the life force, remains the way it is. It is eternal. It is pure in itself. There is nothing you can add to it. No possibility of evolution. So both the ends, the physical body as well as the causal body, they cannot evolve. Then what evolution are we talking about? We're talking of evolution of consciousness. That is possible. Then in order to understand this consciousness, what becomes of this consciousness? If you see this slide, there's a larger circle that represents consciousness. And within its terrain, there is intellect, there is mind, and there is ego. The field of consciousness is affected by all these lower circles of intellect, mind, and ego. Consciousness keeps changing from the animal level of existence to human level of existence to divine level of existence and much more beyond that. Consciousness is affected by our intellect, our mind, the way we think, the way we feel also, and how this ego interferes or refines our consciousness. So let's study what becomes of mind, for example. If consciousness has to evolve, the other three things and many other aspects related to consciousness field has to be studied. We're going to touch only on these three aspects, intellect, mind, and ego. What becomes of intellect? What becomes of mind? And what becomes of ego at the pinnacle of evolution of consciousness? Mind. So in order to understand the evolution of mind, we have to understand the function of the mind. Function is to think. Function of the mind is to think. What becomes of it when it is fully evolved? It remains in resonance with the heart. Mind eclipses with individual heart. Mind moves away from mere thinking into instant feeling. Let me share with you something. When you are encountering some problems in life, you become morose and you keep brooding over it for days or months together until your mother or your spouse or your sister notices it. They begin asking you, oh, what is wrong with you? And you may say, the problem that you have with them. Often, they come up with the instant solution even before you some finish your questions on the problem. How does that happen? How does your mother is able to feel the problem or your wife feels the problem and comes up with a solution which you could not solve by continuous thinking or brooding over it. Problems can easily be solved by feeling the problem. Likewise, experiencing, when we meditate, we meditate with thought, idea of the thought. And what is the thought? We think that the divine presence is there in my heart. It's a thought. But as the process 
unfolds during meditation, we move away from thinking to feeling. There's a little step or larger, greater steps we take during meditation where thought is actualized in the form of experience. That is the progress of the mind, when it moves away from thinking to instant feeling. You think of God and instantly you are able to feel. You think of your beloved, you are feeling the essence, the vibratory pattern of your beloved right in you. Likewise, the intellect. Intellect, what becomes of intellect as it evolves? Psychology says intellect, when it matures, becomes intelligence. When intelligence matures, it becomes intuition. When intuition evolves, it becomes wisdom. There are no special words when you to quote what becomes of wisdom when it evolves. There are no words for it. Likewise, ego, what becomes of ego? Is there anything like ego at all? Yes. Ego can be your best friend, just as mind can be your best friend, as well as your worst enemy. Many people who meditate, they are tormented because they are not able to regulate their mind and they begin to consider, I have been victimized by my own mind. My mind doesn't stop thinking, rubbish. Likewise, ego. I can prevail upon anyone with ego and become the target of their hatred. Will that help me evolve? When many people hate you because you are so egoistic, what becomes of your consciousness? Think over it. If you are a musician, for example, and you are a best, you are good at playing a flute. And you share this knowledge with people in Auroville. Oh, I can play flute. And immediately Sister Jayanti will say, why don't you come and perform? You go to Pondicherry at Auroville and start performing your flute. Fine. Is, there, is it egoistic to say I'm a flutist? No. It's a fact. If you're a doctor and you say you're a doctor, there is no ego about it. It's a statement of fact. It is what it is. Once you perform your flute recital at Pondicherry at Auroville, everyone on their feet and clapping away for a few minutes, you feel so much of satisfaction in your heart that, wow, I did well. The next day, you are invited again. Would you be happy with your yesterday's performance or today's performance? You will like to surpass your own performance. So here, the very idea that I would like to surpass my own performance that was yesterday, I can become even better. So, ego is now utilized in your own individual transformation of your talent. You are taking your own talent to a next level. There is improvisation. But to say that nobody is better than me in entire India in playing the flute, I am the best, no one is better than me then it is arrogance. So ego can manifest in with many faces. It can show many faces. It is up to us how to transcend the mind, the intellect and ego and affect this field of consciousness. 
wrong thinking of the mind, applying wrong intelligence to logic, and blatantly becoming arrogant. What becomes of consciousness? It will shrink, it will contract. Per contra, when you do find or you come across that eureka moment like Archimedes, the intelligence, the thinking, and the ego, he did not even realize that he was naked in the tub and started running eureka, eureka, eureka. He was not even conscious of himself. What becomes of consciousness then? It simply skyrockets. It is at its pinnacle. Now, coming back to Ujjasri or Will's or Windows dream, it was a dream, but was it practical? Suppose if, if you are successful in bringing down the supra mind of God on earth. Can you imagine what would have happened to earth? It would have been totally transformed. Every human being, every tree, every animal creature, every little thing on this planet would change. But does or can the nature tolerate uniformity everywhere? Let me ask you one thing. If everyone in Afghanistan, Pakistan, Middle East, China, Russia, all throughout the planet, everyone were given entry to heaven all at once. Virtuous and non-virtuous, saints and criminals, all given free entry to heaven. What will become of that heaven? Can you call that heaven anymore? Changing consciousness means changing your own self from within. Transformation. Reigning of consciousness from heavens, from supramind of God, is comparable to reigning from the sky, the actual rain that we experience in, in monsoon in India. It falls in Telangana, where it is rocky land. It falls in Rajasthan, full of desert. It falls in forests, falls in rivers and oceans. We all individual human beings are like these entities. Some are forests, some are stones, some are like rivers, some are like fertile soils, fertile heart. Fertile hearts can take the benefit of when the consciousness reigns from above. Hearts which are stone-like, desert-like. Of course, the rains will cool them a bit, but you cannot grow anything on them. So even if Supra mind of God had an opportunity of descending, how many would get this transformation? It would be possible only in those hearts who are receptive. And our receptivity is different. Each individual's receptivity is different. It was a beautiful dream of Pujasri Aravindo. It is up to us how to fulfill those dreams and actualize that potential. He was not ignorant about it. He knew very well that if Lord Krishna could not change the consciousness of Duryodhan, if Lord Rama could not change the consciousness of Ravana or his mother Kaikeyi, what are we? We are mere human beings. Great personalities like Swami Vivekananda or Auroville, they can dream all they like. If gods can fail, who are we to succeed in changing, transforming human individuals? 
each one of us has to be welcoming to this change. Each one of us has to become thirsty and hungry for such a change. Each hunger or thirst be, uh, is, are they possible to be quenched or quelled? Philosophies and theologies, however great, only purpose they can serve is to create some longing in our hearts, create some level of thirst, some create some level of hunger for higher level of consciousness. Having such levels of longing, what is the next step? I must fulfill my thirst. I must quen quench my thirst or quell my hunger. I will have to eat, I will have to drink, and that is a practice. The way we have this consciousness is very limited. This limited consciousness is like a thin film of water, which is sandwiched between two giant oceans of superconsciousness and subconsciousness. We must allow this thin film, which is sandwiched between two giant oceans, to expand into superconsciousness and permit it to dive deeper into subconsciousness. Is it going to happen automatically? No. Can anyone bring it down? Can Lord Krishna bring it down? Can the great Pujasi Aravindo bring it down and help peace rise in my superconsciousness and dive into subconsciousness? The thin film can become a broad band. I can go into superconsciousness only through meditation and meditation alone. I must practice reading books, intellectualizing. It is not going to help me reach and cross or make me fly into sky of superconsciousness. Only meditation and not just meditation of ordinary type. It must be aided by something can, that can take my consciousness and help me fly into superconsciousness. You need a carrier. And that carrier has to be more refined than consciousness itself. And what is more refined than consciousness? We'll take up that in the next argument. And what about the subconscious, which is the darkness? How this subconsciousness was created? All psychologists agree that subconsciousness is the product of my past. And past baggage remains ingrained in our being, in our consciousness. In two forms, mainly one is emotional memory. And another is cognitive. Emotionally, I can forgive anything, but I cannot forget because it's part, it is hardwired in my brain, memory, especially the cognitive memory is hardwired in my brain. Emotional is also embedded in my consciousness, but I can let go of it. I can reduce the burden of my emotional memory by letting it go, by forgiving by doing the evening cleaning that is taught in heartfulness way. Evening cleaning does one fundamental thing. It improves our understanding. And when understanding is there, new awareness sets in. And with this new awareness, the darkness created by all these impressions can go away, can be removed. Rising into sky of superconsciousness. When we close our eyes and we reach to that superconsciousness in a very natural way through pranavati. And this soaring into the sky of consciousness 
again, just as supra mind can affect the heart consciousness of people, depending upon the level of opening of their heart. More open the heart, more deserving the soul, it can impact us in a better way, faster way, in an impactful way. Consciousness. People say, what is the use of improving consciousness? Can you give me some examples? How consciousness can change my life? What are the practical applications of consciousness? Refined consciousness versus a very gross level of consciousness. Consciousness, in order to understand this role of consciousness, I will have to define what is consciousness. It can simply be defined as one thing, it's a degree of awareness. Next step, once you become aware with your consciousness, what do you do next? You respond, you reciprocate in the most proper way. So consciousness is also about reciprocating appropriately. Degree of awareness with calculated or appropriate reciprocated response, reciprocal response. Let me explain to you what I'm trying to say. You are in your bedroom with your wife. You have some argument, you're fighting. You are on top of your voice. Suddenly your toddler, your daughter comes into the room. She's four year old. Moment you notice your daughter has entered the bedroom, that means you have become aware of her presence. This awareness is noticed. How will you reciprocate? How will you respond? Would you continue fighting? Or would you start smiling at each other and take your daughters in your arms and hug her? That's one level of response. If you don't do this and continue fighting, that also reflects your level of consciousness. Well, well, well. We are all struggling. We are all moving ahead. Some with a total speed, some will a giant quantum leaps, but we all are moving. Trees and animals, they are also evolving at consciousness level. But through meditation, millions of years can be saved. You are then on an accelerated path of evolution or of helping evolve your consciousness. That's why Lord Rama, Lord Krishna, and saints, sages like Astavakra, Vasisthamuni, Vishwamitra, they all talk about consciousness, how to help it evolve. If you read Vasistha Sanhita or Vishwamitra's contribution or Ram Gita, Astavakra Gita, you know, this was the same time Raja Janak having dialogue with Astavakra. Lord Rama and Lakshman talking about consciousness during their journey in forests. That was the only entertainment they had all through 14 years. Both brothers and mother Sita would sit together under a tree and talk about consciousness. And it is there registered in Lakshman Gita or Ram Gita. You can refer that. You can also look into Conscious, I mean, topics on consciousness by, but in Vasistha Sanhita. This was the same time, same epoch. So you can say consciousness is not a new topic for us. 
it has been going on and on and on. But somehow, we have lost the way of how to improve it, how to aware, how to make this consciousness soar into sky of superconsciousness and allow it to plunge into deepest oceans of our subconsciousness. Again, heartfulness way of practice helps us to broaden this very fine film of consciousness. When you hear all this thing, it looks so beautiful. Oh, wow, consciousness. Makes you happy to listen. It makes you also happy to undergo such dreams. Okay, I would like to evolve my consciousness. Great. You feel blissful when you are at its pinnacle. The bliss of a yogi. Romance of the teenagers or romance of married people, or the playing of children with their toys. They're all degrees of pleasures, degrees of enjoyment. Just as a child is happy with playing toys, teenagers and married people happy with their romance. Yogi is also in a state of bliss, savoring the flavors spectrum of consciousness. It's also like a toy in the hands of a yogi. You are still playing with a toy. I will leave you with the question, my dear friends, what is beyond consciousness? What is it that supports this consciousness? Thank you for your listening and look forward to your visit at Kanha. Thank you. Thank you, Jainti. Thank you. Namaskar, Ma. Namaskara. Thank you. When you do get a chance, uh, please come to Kana, my dear. Absolutely. We uh, have been uh, eagerly looking forward to it, uh, Daji, uh, and do hope that uh, we are able to come there. And we've heard such wonderful things about it. And thank you so much for your blessings. Your Thank you. Insights today, we deeply appreciate it. Namaste. Thank you. And I forgot to thank your representative who came to specially invite me, uh, Brother Luca. Luca, Ravindra, the whole team has been working very hard. Yes. And, uh, with, with your blessings, I think they have thank made you. all this happen. Thank you. Thank you, Ma. Thank you. Pranams to everyone. Pranams. So I hope you have uh, got a nice uh, introduction to meditation. Uh, we were very, very lucky to have directly Daji come and uh, uh, hold this session. And um, during the day, so today I will invite you again after breakfast to explore this practice that he's speaking about. What do we do in heartfulness? to allow this change of consciousness to happen. So, you know, being part of it is also something that I liked when I uh, discovered this method when I was in France. I felt I didn't want to receive explanation about text, but I wanted to be part of it. I wanted something that would empower me to be myself the agent of my own change understand myself better and practice. And there's no other way than to have a daily practice in any path of yoga 
to be able to feel the change. So what I liked in uh, heartfulness is the simplicity of the method and uh, the fact that uh, it can be embraced by anyone. So Oroville being the symbol of, uh, you know, all those culture coming together, those countries, 164 countries coming together at the onset of this place, it is very important that the method that... Uh, for me, I wanted to choose should be something that everybody can relate to. And I've been very uh, lucky to be involved in heartfulness with uh, the, an international program that invited people to India, to Chennai uh, at that time, Kana was not available, to learn this method and then take it back to their country. And regardless of their uh, cultural background, education, religious uh, belief, uh, they all felt the effect of this method and went back to their country trained to be able to also pass on uh, this teaching. Because if we are waiting for everybody to come to India, then it's going to take a lot of time. So we have to be able to uh, give this knowledge everywhere. And why, in my experience, why is this, uh, you know, something that people can understand? It's because it all touches the most important organ in our system. It's the heart. If you talk from the heart to the heart to someone, you know, this is the best way to reach out. And even if we don't speak the same language, speaking from heart to heart allows a communication to happen. So in the day today, I will invite you to come again uh, at um, 11 o'clock. Is that correct? And um, I would like to take you to an experience, not only a talk, but an experience of the second element of heartfulness, which is the cleaning practice that Daji also evoked. What can I do for myself to help, help for example, my mind to settle a little bit? so that I can enjoy my meditation better. But also, you know, cleaning, so cleaning marks, marks, works at the level of my daily life, you know, it changes my daily life. But it also works at a deeper level. So we will talk about that at 11 o'clock and how all this is part of yoga. 10, 10, 10 o'clock, sorry, 10 o'clock. And there is a third uh, part, third technique uh, practice that uh, we have also in heartfulness is the one that you do just before you go to sleep. And it's a short practice of 10 minutes of, again, a short meditation with an intention in Sankalpa where I enter the night in a state of consciousness that will allow, you know, my sleep to also be part of this evolution of consciousness we're talking about. So how to enter the sleep, not with a, you know, very heavy head hitting the pillow and falling asleep because we are so tired, but entering the sleep with a lighter consciousness that allows those hours also to be effective. Now, all this is yoga. It's a specific, you know, modern way of Raja Yoga. And this is what heartfulness offers. We train in meditation so that we maintain that condition of less fluctuation. And we also help the fluctuation to be less by doing the cleaning part. Okay. So if you want, I'm going to take you through uh, uh, the experience of a guided cleaning. But before that, I will take you through an experience of what is awareness through breathing practices and a little bit of movement too. Okay, there's a big, fantastic science behind yoga that is for me more interesting than uh, medically understanding our body because it really deals with uh, subtle practices 
we are subtle, we are not mechanical, we are not just physiology, we are energy. And this continuous of energy starts with the asanas, understanding of my body reacts to things. So there are things that happen here. The breath, you know, which is the uh, link between the body and the mind. And then the mind, which is really the domain of heartfulness practices. Okay. So before uh, we start with movements and breathing, the cleaning practice is a simple practice that we do at the end of the day. We say when your work is over, so you finished your work and uh, whatever happened, come home. It's quite important that you come home so that you are in that environment that is yours. Energy is different. It's your home. It feels good. And then you sit in the same position that, you know, comfortable for meditation. And you will use your mind, so it's not a meditation, it's a, a practice where you use your willpower to remove all the impressions of the day from the back. And you imagine your back from the top of the head till the tailbone, entire spine, and imagine that the entire back is letting go of all these impressions. What are impressions? Impressions is Anything that you've lived during the day, what you spoke, what you heard, what you saw, what you felt, it leaves a trace. It leaves a trace in different ways. Most of the time we're not aware. Sometimes we know very well that something went wrong or something was too, you were too happy about something that you would want it again. You don't want to let go. That's also an impression that happens during the day, this is taken care of by the evening cleaning. Now, Daji also spoke about the subconscious. Subconscious, to understand what it is, he said, everything that, you know, you've kept from the past is there in your subconscious. How do I address that? A deeper cleaning can be done by the, you know, when you sit face to face for a meditation by people who are trained as meditation trainer and allows those impressions that have fossilized to be removed. Why should we remove them? Because they form the patterns, the habits of, you know, what we're used to do. So I'm sure all of us experience, you know, these moments where you feel like, why do I still react like this? Or why am I again in this situation? I know consciously that I don't want to be in that situation, but I'm still there. And that happens, you know, this capacity of getting away from these habits happens when you have removed what keeps you going, those tendencies. So cleaning works at different level. You have the one that you do every day to make sure that you don't create habits, that you can, you know, focus better, that your meditation will be better. And there's the one that is done at a deeper level, once a week or twice a week, where the uh, meditation trainer will help you to remove something that is deeper. And an image that comes that is really, really nice is the image of a river. Okay, so... The river has a riverbed, it has the water flowing in it, yes? So when I go and when I do the cleaning practice, I'm able to remove the water from the riverbed. But the riverbed is still there. And that is a tendency that is in myself. And for that, I need to do my own practice. I need to work also on the yama niyamas of yoga the way I behave, my lifestyle, so that I'm able to let with practice this riverbed completely go, you know, completely disappear. And then that tendency is not there. So like Daji was saying, you know, there's no possibility of just a magic thing that will allow you to immediately soar into super consciousness or, you know, being more aware of your subconscious. 
there's a need for us to practice every day. I'm sure you're all busy, very busy in your life, whatever, uh, you know, uh, and I'm speaking uh, uh, as a doctor, but also as a, a mother. So mothers are very, very busy all day long, and they don't really have time to do a practice for their own, and especially they don't take the time to do it. So to find a practice that allows, you know, really a simple thing uh, to be done in the morning, in the evening, and just at night, this was possible for me, and that's why I stuck to it for the past 30 years, because I felt it's helping me. I work faster. I'm more available for my family. I'm in a nicer way, more quiet. And I also enjoy it, because I get to know myself better. So enough speaking. I would like to invite you for a, an experimentation of this uh, technique. Now is the, you know, it's the beginning of the day, so uh, this is something that we should do more in the evening, and that very, very, we call it also rejuvenation. It's very freshening, you know, like when you enter home. So we'd like you to sit comfortably. You can remove your bags or whatever is, uh, uh, would not, uh, you know, put things on the floor. And on the chair, uh, sit with your feet if possible, you know, if your feet are reaching the floor, Plant them on the floor. You can come a little forward on your chair so that your back is straight. Okay, so fit on the floor for people on the chair. Otherwise, just simple uh, straight spine attitude. And I would like you to close your eyes. And first, to be aware of the noise outside the room, in nature, the birds. The garden you've entered before coming to this place. Keep them in your mind. And slowly bring your attention to the room. This room where we are all seated. The noise in this room. The people around you. Now bring your attention to your body seated on the floor or on the chair. Become aware of your feet, your legs, your back straight, shoulders relaxed, your hands on your knees, spine is straight, chin slightly down. is awareness of your body. Scan your body and feel if there is any tension or maybe some pain somewhere. Be aware of the body. Now become aware of your breath. Normal breathing. Be aware of the inspiration. And the exhalation. Like the waves, they come and go. Just going up 
during inhalation, relaxing with exhalation. Let your awareness stay on the breath. Now become aware of your thoughts. Are you here in this moment? Is your mind getting distracted? Become aware of your mood. How do you feel right now? You're feeling happy, feeling sad. Are you feeling upset? You're feeling tired. Just be aware. Now bring your attention to your heart. Beyond all this, the core of your being, the seat, <clears throat> center of all your systems. Now bring back your attention to the breath. Place a hand on your abdomen, just below the navel. And when you exhale, <clears throat> let the hand draw inwards. Let your abdomen draw inwards on the exhalation. Let the inhalation be natural. When you exhale, slowly, consciously, take your abdomen inside and exhale. Try to make your exhalation longer. Now keep your hands on your knees, release the counting, the exhalation, breathe normally. And slowly open your eyes. Now follow me with a few movement of the spine. So take your hands to the side And slowly, being aware of uh, people next to you, maybe you can shift a little forward and backward. Inhale, take both your hands up above your head. Join, join the palm of your hands above your head. Extend to the ceiling and exhale, come down. Very good. Again, inhale. And while you do this, stay very aware of the inhalation. And exhalation, exhale, very good. 
One more time, inhale. Interlock your fingers and stretch, stretch, stretch. Very good. And exhale. Good. Now, place your left hand on your right knee. Place the right hand at the back. Inhale here. And as you exhale, turn and look at the back. And stay there. Breathe there. <clears throat> And come back to the center. Same thing on the other side. Take your left hand under your right knee, <clears throat> left hand behind. Inhale, exhale, look at the back. Inhale and come back to the center. Very good. Now you can grab the chair at the back or interlock your fingers at the back. Straighten your elbows. Open the chest. Inhale here. Look up. And exhale. You release the elbows. Round your back. Take your chin to the chest. Again, inhale. Mm -hmm. Take your chin to the chest. Very good. <coughs> One last movement. So all of you, make sure you take your right hand to the ceiling. <coughs> right hand to the ceiling. The other one is on the floor. And as you exhale, a small bending lateral bend. Very good. You can close your eyes if you want. Inhale, stretch up to the ceiling. And exhale down. Same thing on the other side. Inhale, take your hand to the ceiling, left hand. Close your eyes. Exhale, bend to the side. Inhale up to the ceiling and exhale down. Very good. Now take your hands on the knees. Close your eyes. Feel the effect of this simple practice of the spine on your body and scan your body one more time. How does it feel? Is there a shift in my energy at the body level? By observing, we train our sensitivity, our awareness, Starting with the body is a very good place to start. Keep your eyes closed. Bring again your attention to the breath. Observe the inhalation and the exhalation. When you inhale, your chest is lifting up. When you exhale, your abdomen slowly goes inwards. Draw your abdomen towards the spine. Inhale, chest up. Exhale, abdomen towards the spine. Try to lengthen the inhalation. Lengthen the exhalation. Now at the end of inhalation, pause for one second. And at the end of exhalation, again pause for one second.
be aware of this instant between inhalation and exhalation. Now drop the breath regulation, keep your eyes closed. And we will start the guided cleaning. We start with the thought that all the complexities all the impressions elements that have impacted my system are going out through the back. You can imagine either vapor or smoke. Give this strong suggestion to yourself that all complexities and impurities leave your system through the back. Imagine your back from the top of the head till the spine and visualize all these impurities coming out in the form of smoke. Do not try to remember anything in particular. As you sit here now, whatever is troubling the flow of energy is leaving your system through the back. You have to put your willpower. It's an active process. All complexities, all impurities leave my system through the back. Now try to feel the process happening. All impurities leaving from the back. And leaving you pure again.
and all the complexities. going out of your system in the form of smoke. And as they leave you, you become simple again. And when you do it in the evening, continue this for 15 minutes. And as the process of cleaning goes on, you will start feeling lightness in the heart. In this space that you have created, invite the sacred current from the source to enter your heart and fill your heart completely. The sacred current enters from the front and helps in the process of cleaning. All the complexities and impurities are leaving your system through the back in the form of smoke. And in its place, the sacred current from the source is filling your heart. Feeling your heart and your entire system completely. Your heart is a sacred place. And we end the process of cleaning with a thought that the cleaning has been well done. And when you feel ready, you can slowly open your eyes. <coughs> So this guided part is the cleaning practice that we do in the evening to complement the morning meditation. Morning meditation helps the expansion. In meditation only, we become more and more aware. But to help that, the cleaning process allows to prepare ourselves and to remove things from the subconscious that may, you know, prevent our growth. So we'll open the floor for questions. I hope you have an idea of what consciousness is all about. Consciousness can be in my body. It can be in my breath. I can, you know, allow my uh, focus to happen when I, you know, maybe start with the breath, if it's difficult for some people, and slowly, you know, with the mind that regulates, we can enter meditation. If you have questions, 
uh, will be happy to answer. I'll invite my husband to join to answer the questions. Maybe if you want to, uh, some of you maybe have uh, tried for the first time, if you want to share how it felt. Could you feel a difference with meditation? Yeah, it's not a process where we let go and we, uh, yeah, we let the things or we witness. We have to be active in this part all the time, you know. So we do it for 20 minutes. Any question? We have a mic if you want. You want to add something? Yes. Tiens, le micro. Yeah, it's working, it's working. This one? Yeah, two questions. Tu veux lui donner le tien? Je parle aussi. Donne le tien. Yeah, hi. Uh, definitely, it does feel better now that we have uh, let go of uh, some of our vrittis or, you know, the impressions, what uh, we understand it as. Uh, in my understanding, um, to be able to meditate peacefully, we have to maintain some amount of awareness throughout the day. So how can we make sure we maintain awareness throughout the day while we are doing our daily work or whatever? Because I think that's, again, the you know one of the most difficult things to do when we are doing something, we are teaching our children or cooking or whatever work we may be doing. How can we make sure we are aware? So it's a good question. So the... Um, both grow together, okay? So uh, it's good already that you're aware you should be aware during the day. Uh, we start with the meditation in the morning so that it sets the mood for the day. And then we try to retain the feeling that we had at the end of meditation throughout the day. So it might be intermittent at the beginning, and then it might become more and more important, uh, more and more frequent. But the fact that you are interested already to be more and more aware is the good place to start. And there will be moments where you will be completely engrossed in doing something else and feeling very much out of balance. But with the practice of meditation and cleaning, there's really, you know, all the tools where your mind will be more settled and where you will be able to take a step back in your daily activities, so that you are not completely uh, taken by life as it happens. So it's it's both. You practice those two moments so that you are more aware intensely at that moment. And then slowly you have also to practice during the day, remembering this moment. But first you have to have a taste. Is it good to practice this cleansing on empty stomach or anything? Is there any condition like that? So all practices in yoga are always better on empty stomach, but there's no such prescription. You know, it, it, you will feel a difference again, you know, as you practice. Uh, if your stomach is too full, you will never feel good to do any inner practice because then your attention is on something heavy. But if, but that is not a prescription as it is.
And there are days when, you know, you just feel too tamasic, too lazy. You just don't want to do anything. I know I have to be aware. And now, for example, if I have to practice cleansing, on certain days, I just don't feel like, is it okay to just let go? Or do I have to make up my mind that no matter what, I have to sit through this? It's a good thing to try to work with telling yourself no matter what you have to do. But the most important thing will be the attitude. And if a good reason for you to be feeling like you want to sit and do it is if you enjoy your practice. And if you enjoy it and you feel I'm definitely better if I do it, you know? So for me, the, the cleaning was the thing that uh, really dragged, you know, drove me to this meditation before meditation itself. Because I think my mind was too busy, so I did not feel anything at the beginning in meditation. And, uh, but cleaning, I could feel immediately the effect. I would be less tired. I would, the, the place where I was using it the most was when I was on night duties. And although on night duties, you understand that it's ER, it's very, very busy. You are always, uh, on the call. There's a lot of tension. I had to do my cleaning practice to be able to survive emotionally. And physically. So when you feel it has an effect, then you want to do it. So there's less of a drag of, oh, I have to do it. It is not something that you push yourself to do. It's your, something that you feel like, let me see how this is going to make me understand myself better, feel better, and understand others better also. Thank you. Uh, I'm new to this technique, so uh, excuse my ignorance. Uh, just by thinking or imagining that your uh, past, uh, let's say, impressions of the day go by imagining they go out. I'm not very convinced. I mean, just by self-hypnosis, we can say uh, they go out or imagining that the light from divine is coming in. Yeah. It comes in, it helps. I mean, I'm not fully convinced. So can you give me some I thoughts on that? I can relate to you because I was very doubtful when I started to. So I started in the same place where I thought, okay, all these things of even self-conviction, I didn't, I didn't believe it until I started and tried. You know, and so with practice, when you feel actually that it is happening, so you start with thinking and then you feel it is happening and that has a different effect. And with only with your own experience of trying it. So I tried at some point I felt, okay, I have to try because I, I saw people who were practicing this method and they were... They were happy, they were successful, they were really people I could really, you know, I felt they have something special. So let me try what they do. I think. No, but how do we really, no, I may be fooling myself that they are, sanskars are going out. But uh, I mean, how, how uh, is there some way of knowing that we'll it will help? I think, yeah, some compliment. I will add something. Uh, by taking the opposite thought that you have, if you use your thought to think of gr something gross, you will feel immediately the effect on your body. So the thought is all powerful. And with our thoughts, we create our life. And we know this because when we have a bad thought, we have a physical reaction. So here you're using the thought power in a positive way. And in a light way, you start with a thought and then with the willpower, you push things. So it's not just thinking also. You start with a suggestion that all impurities are cleaned out. But then you, you back the suggestion with your will. Because if you just think, as you say, well, it's a happy thought, but it has to be backed with a will. At the beginning, you may do it properly, you may not do it properly. 
So that's why in this system, we have a, a backup system where you can have those uh, sessions of cleaning uh, done with people we call preceptors. We have people called preceptors who can do this cleaning for you. And you will, so that really makes your, your own, because the whole basis is your own practice. Those are really the poles that will create a momentum that will create the possibility of continuing remembering in the day. And that will deepen your interest. But then your interest will be really awakened when you feel something. So at the beginning, having uh, those sittings, what we call sittings, where the cleaning is done on one-to-one, -one, you will feel lighter. So that, that's not something, I mean, that's my experience, but that's something that should be your experience. Now, when you feel lighter, you can start thinking, okay, now there's something here, so I'll try on myself. And maybe at the beginning, the cleaning will be less effective when you do it on yourself than when somebody else is doing it on you. For some reason, it's easier to do something on somebody else than to do it on ourselves. Always. <laughs> so it, re it really helps to take sittings. And for that, we have people. And, uh, and then there is another level of cleaning is when you go to see some people like uh, Daji. There are a few people that are at a certain level, then their thought is more powerful than ours. That the meaning of that is it's effective. So if they just see you for five minutes, they may do more in terms of cleaning than we would be able to do in 30 minutes. <clears throat> so you see there are levels of the more your mind is under your control, the more your willpower, the more effective will be your cleaning on yourself or on others. Mm -hmm. So, but we should not start with the doubt because, I mean, it's, it's human to doubt. But the thing also is that the moment you doubt, if you see it, for example, and say, okay, I don't think this will work. <laughs> it will not work. <laughs> because you've introduced what we call the poison in your mind. And your mind will not basically produce the result. So the mind can do many things, many wonderful things. <clears throat> Use the mind to clean ourselves. <clears throat> but you can also get the help of somebody else to do it for you if you're not comfortable. How to maintain our uh, uh, peace for sleepless time? Our, I didn't know. How to maintain our peaceful uh, for our sleepless time? For the sleep time? When we no, sleep? No, no, no. Not sleeping time. Uh, actually, the overworking time. Some sleepless time. Sleepless? You mean yes. not able to sleep? Not able to sleep. Not uh, able to sleep. Okay. Overworking time. How to maintain our peace? Okay, so that's that is definitely this this technique, especially for that. Okay. You know, doing uh, so if again, if you feel not comfortable, you know, when you do it on your own, mm -hmm. take the help of a you know preceptor, meditation trainer, yeah, okay. to help you till. But you have to attempt to it day after day okay. after day so that you you'll be able to do that. But you will definitely uh, your sleep will be better okay. if you do the cleaning in the evening. Okay, okay, thank you. It actually produces, you know, on the electroencephalogram, you know, our brain has yeah. different waves, okay? Yes. And uh, uh, when we start uh, doing these practices, we end up having a brain in, mm -hmm. we are not sleeping, but our brain is at the same state as when we are sleeping. And in that state, our body actually, you know, makes a lot of uh, uh, substances, hormones, mm -hmm that allows our body to heal and to rest and to restore itself. So mm -hmm. this practice of uh, 
meditation and especially cleaning will help you to sleep better. Okay, ma'am. Yeah, it does. Okay, thank you, sister. But if you're at actually, the if you start, actually, she is asking me, not sleepless. When she is working, when she is not sleeping, yeah. how to make it peaceful? She is asking. Yes. Not for sleepless. She, but she is asking when she is working, working. Same she thing. She is doing work. She is asking. Not for sleepless. <laughs> Can, uh, actually, Did I answer your question or not? Actually, I have one and a half years baby. Uh, she did not sleep well. Okay. Uh, she's playing in uh, midnight also. So I work in morning, uh, midnight, uh, all time, uh, always I'm working. Mm, daytime, I'm uh, sometimes sleeping. Uh, I don't have some uh, separate time to sleep. Yes. Uh, to care for me. So that's so, a very... So that's your good. moment. If you can have someone, that's my experience okay. with babies not sleeping at night. Huh. <laughs> Especially your own. Uh, the only thing that really keeps the mind, you know, sane, because uh, we need to sleep. Yes. I used to tell my husband, you know, cats die if you don't let them sleep. <laughs> We need to sleep, you know, so yes. when you feel so uh, powerless, you know, this cleaning will definitely help. Yes. Either you do it for yourself if you're too tired, okay. take the time, ask, you know, your mother-in-law mother uh, to take no. care of the baby and take the time to take a meditation session. Okay. It will definitely help you. Uh, uh, okay. Okay. Thank it's you. also... You know, for women, we have less strict rules because... The masters, they know that mm -hmm. women's life is very uh, demanding. So Daji is many times telling the story of his own preceptor. Okay. She had no time to meditate and her family was also against it. Okay. She used to go to the bathroom a little longer than usual and meditate <laughs> there. <laughs> so, you know, and also for ladies, you know, some ladies, they have to cook early morning. So uh, the master says for them, they can meditate any time in the day. So for us, we advise before dawn because it's the best time. But if you can't, any time you have, even if it's only 10 minutes, okay. you will center yourself and you will feel refreshed. So take those time, any time of the day, you know. And if sometimes you cannot go to sleep, for me, what I do is I start doing my cleaning, lying down. We should not do this, huh? but I'm telling you. <laughs> Normally, we do the cleaning when we come back from work. And, but suppose you had no time to do it. You lie down, you start doing your cleaning, you will go to sleep. Meditation, uh, cleaning, meditation. Uh, this uh, way, sir. Uh, some some differences here. Meditation is better or cleaning is better for me? For you, for you yes. when you feel heavy, it's an indication you should do 10-minute cleaning. Okay. When you feel agitated, that your mind is going, you feel, you know, unsettled, unbalanced, that's the time when you should sit and just meditate on the heart. Because just 10 minutes of that, you will feel your energy regroup yeah. and your balance restore. Because if you don't keep a, a minimum of balance, nothing you do will be correct. Your work, the way you talk, everything, the way you behave with your baby. The balance we have is the minimum we should take care of, you know. Then we talk of expanding consciousness, but first we need peace. Okay. So get that peace within yourself. And sometimes it goes because of circumstances. That's what I call unbalance. Then you meditate a little bit. If one person is practicing in the house, it will affect the others. So 
you know, when you practice, know that you will also help. You know, as a mother, you want to cook well, you want to take care properly. Taking care of yourself first allows you to take care of others better. So it's, uh, and uh, don't make it a struggle that you feel bad yet. You can't do it. But uh, try to find the time to do it. It's really worth it. I was thinking of this uh, place, you know, the, we, we have five minutes, no? Yes. Is that correct? Yes. Uh, you know, this place is called the Hall of Unity, which is uh, very uh, beautiful to, to talk about one of the methods that uh, deals with uh, exactly that topic, you know, unity. So um, someone was asking, you know, before the session, uh, do you think that there is an evolution of consciousness at the global level? And um, when you come to a place like Oroville, where there is a group of people who, are, who have come to do that, you know, uh, to, to try to uh, bring some unity, to go beyond the uh, differences that are there, keeping the diversity of people, uh, you realize, you know, so in my field, I work with uh, many schools of yoga. I realize that, uh, we really share the same, uh, same aspiration. And, um, and that the idea of uh, service is also there, you know, service and unity is there, uh, in the heart of all these different methods. And, uh, it's very nice to know that, uh, Oroville is inviting all the schools to come. <laughs> and to propose what they do, because Daiji also recognizes that, you know, um, uh, start wherever you are with whatever methods that suits you. Uh, they all are yoga paths. They all lead to the same concepts. But when we work together and we speak together, we speak the same language. And we have different techniques, but that's only the techniques. So look at a technique that suits you, uh, this one suited me, you know, and I actually didn't have to look anywhere else because I've, I still feel it suits me and I still discover more, you know, I still feel more and more rich as I practice. So, um, but unless you make your own experience, there's nothing I can give in terms of words. It's all about feeling. And for that, it needs a dedicated daily practice. Nobody can teach you. You have to feel yourself. Now, Madam is on the screen, though, I mean, online. We are going to listen to Madam and our brother Manoj, who is the resident of Auroville. And, you know, you might have heard about Dr. Jayanti Ravi. Jayanti Ravi is the secretary for Auroville Foundation. And before that, you know, she has been holding lots of hats. In fact, when you look at a personality, you normally see that, okay, she is the secretary and an IOS officer, but, oh, to come to know that, oh, she's a good writer. She has written lots of books and she's a scientist and she's a very active uh, person and worked as a secretary for uh, health and uh, family welfare for Gujarat government for many years. And she was initiating all the programs, especially for Swachh Bharat, that type of um, cleanliness program for the whole country. So she is holding lots of things. But here now she's a secretary and she is going to talk on Orville and the integral yoga. And we do have our brother uh, Manoj who is standing right here, will also join us here on stage. And he will talk about Orville and especially about Sri and his integral yoga and how in, it evolved to this stage. So after that, we will take, he will take all our questions regarding whatever you are understanding. So it is interesting when I was having my tea over there, one of our sisters said that, oh, this is my first time. I don't know anything about this place. That was very interesting. Yes. This, so this introduction on Auroville and Integral Yoga by Madam Jayanti Ravi, as well as uh, Integral Yoga by Dr., uh, our friend, brother M M Manoj, will really 
help us to understand our will and its uh, purpose here. Thank you. Madam Ravi, on screen. <laughs> uh, yeah, before that, um, our friend Marco will play a small movie on Auroville, which will give you an introduction about Auroville. After that, ma'am will take over. At the moment in the planet, I believe we are really uh, sowing the branch in which we are sitting. And uh, we are gonna have to, we're gonna ha there's gonna have to be a quantum jump into something else. If you look around the world today, you see division, terrorism, war, racism, politics. Everywhere it looks absolutely impossible. And yet I think everybody feels within themselves it does not have to be like that. There should be somewhere upon Earth that no nation could claim as its sole property. A place where all human beings of goodwill, sincere in their aspiration, would live freely as citizens of the world, obeying one simple authority, that of supreme truth. There are many people who would like to experience a different way of living and a better future, which everybody dreams of somehow, not knowing where and how to go about it. Auroville provides that possibilities. Auroville is an international township where already we have 40 nationalities. And one of the important aims of Auroville is uh, to practice human unity. If we could achieve unity here, what a fantastic example it will be to the outside world. A place above religion, a place above nation, a place above uh, color, creed, caste. There are numerous theories and ideas about what it will take to make the world a better place. More freedom, economic and social reforms, cleaner cars, canvas shopping bags, spiritual ideals, new technologies. Auroville, a 44-year-old experimental city, is an attempt to prove true the simple theory that living our lives from a perspective above our differences in conscious awareness of our interconnection with all others is the key to actualizing a more life-affirming environment on our planet. Auroville is the realization of the dream of Mother Mira Alfaza and Sri Aurobindo that a city be established on Earth where individuals of great diversity would live in pursuit of human unity. Sri Aurobindo was one of the first revolutionaries in India, a predecessor to Gandhi. In May 1908, he was arrested for conspiracy and held by the British for one full year. He spent his time in prison in the practice of yoga, where he experienced the possibilities of a divine life on Earth. After his release, he fled to Pondicherry in southern India. It was during this time in Pondicherry that Sri Aurobindo developed and refined the process for effecting the inner transformation he had experienced in prison, a process he called integral yoga, a practice meant to transform rather than transcend life. A divine life upon earth, the ideal that has been placed before us, can only come about by a spiritual change in our whole being, and a radical and fundamental change, an evolution or revolution of our nature Sri Aurobindo. He's been described as a philosopher, as a sage. He said, uh, I am not a philosopher, I was a politician and a poet. And what people consider my philosophy is just a rational expression of my own experiences. At the same time, Mira Alfaza, a young French woman, was discovering similar teachings. As a member of a French delegation to Pondicherry in 1914, the mother, as Mira Alfaza would come to be called, met Sri Aurobindo and later returned to live permanently at the ashram. 
Together, they spent their lives practicing and teaching a life meant to realize divine consciousness on Earth. After the death of Sri Aurobindo in 1950, Mother Mira took up the work of their dream of a place on Earth where a gathering of people of great diversity could live as one united family, a city she would name Oroville. As money became available, she bought up strips of land around a lone banyan tree on a barren plateau near Pondicherry. On February 28, 1968, 5,000 people came to celebrate the inauguration of Oroville. As part of the celebration, one man and one woman from 120 nations brought samples of their native soil and combined them in the urn at the center of the amphitheater. Over the loudspeaker, the mother presented the charter. Oroville belongs to nobody in particular. Oroville belongs to humanity as a whole. But to live in Oroville, one must be the willing servitor of the divine consciousness. Oroville will be the place of an unending education, of constant progress, and a youth that never ages. Oroville wants to be the bridge between the past and the future, taking advantage of all discoveries from without and from within. Oroville will boldly spring towards future realizations. Oroville will be a site of material and spiritual researchers for a living embodiment of an actual human unity. There is no guru here, no living person to whom one can go and ask questions and it's just, we have just this, the charter and, and that's, um, that's yeah, our guide. Mother had one French architect, our chief architect, Mr. Roger Angé. Yes, she appointed him as the chief architect for this place. Roger Angé had a huge uh, office in Paris as architect. And one time uh, he came to Pondy and met the mother. And when the mother met him and heard that he is architect in Paris, she, she said, I have a town to build, international town in Auroville to build. Would you like to do? And he said yes. And uh, it was the beginning. Mother gave in the beginning a sketch to Roger and uh, this plan which we mentioned as Galaxy Plan, it came into being in 1968 at the time of inauguration of Oroville. This town plan is proposed for a population of 50,000 people. It is fairly small, but at the same time relatively dense, but which is also one element of experiment here. How? Because land is limited. Yes. The resources are limited, right from land, water, energy, everything is a part of that. How in five square kilometer, approximately a population of 50,000 can live together in very healthy, happy, inspiring quality of life. Idea is not to compromise on that. And it has all the aspects like right from organic agriculture, renewable energy, water management, less impactful building material. This galaxy plan essentially has four zones. Residential, cultural, industrial, which can also be called economical and international zone. And in the center is the peace area. What we call peace area is Matri Mandir complex, Matri Mandir itself, amphitheater, banyan tree, which is the geographical center of township, Ma Matri Mandir gardens, surrounded by the lake. So this is the central peace area. Vanakkam, everybody. Can you hear me?
Vanakkam. Namaste. If you can hear me, can you raise your hand so I can... Good. Excellent. So, uh, very happy to meet you all today. We had the privilege of seeing all of you and especially listening to Daji this morning. And now, as we want to spend a few minutes talking about what Auroville is and what is it that it was meant to do, I thought I will start with the Sri Aurobindo Gayatri. Om Tat Savitur Varam Rupam Jyoti Parasya Dhimahi Yenna Satye Nadi Satye Nadi Paye Om Tat Savitur Varam Rupam Jo Parasya Dhimahi Yenna Satye Nadi Paye Satye Nadi Paye This is also known as Sri Aurobindo Gayatri and it is a special chant, a mantra, where Sri Aurobindo says, let us meditate on the most auspicious form of the spiritual sun, Savitri. And may that light of the Supreme illumine all our dimensions, every part of our being with the truth. So with this, we will quickly, I, will, I would like to take you through two portions today. First of all, we're very happy that so many of you have come from different parts and we want to extend a very, very warm welcome to all of you to Auroville and hope that this is not the first of your visits and that you come here often and that you also participate in activities happening here. And in fact, the purpose of the city also as you read in the charter or as you heard in the charter in the film, which is the very basis of Auroville. Auroville, I was told that many of our sisters and brothers who are attending today's program would like to hear us speak in Tamil. So I also want to na yellorio variga varga endru varavir kiren ninga yellorum Auroville ke Idan modal Muraya Vandri Kalam, Ana Turumbe, Ninga Ungla Varever Kirom, Ninga Anevarum, Anevarum, Naria Mura Inga Varano, Oruvilla Naria Nigar Chigal Naranjakanga projects Naratri Naranjaka, the Latu Ninga participate Kuda, Ninga Panla, the Lat Kungla Nanga, welcome Pandra. So Oruvil Vandi, it was set up in nineteen sixty eight. So we are just about stepping into the fifty fifth year. Ambati Ainda of the Andepo step Panitruko. It was set up on the 28th of February. And actually, she gave what is known as the Auroville Charter, which you heard in the film that was shown to you. But I think the most important uh, lines in it it says, she said that it does not belong to anybody. It belongs to nobody in particular, but it belongs to humanity as a whole. But to live in Auroville, one must be a willing servitor of divine consciousness. And then she also says it will be a place of an unending education, of constant progress, and a youth that never ages. So in your Auroville, you'll also find many people who are on the other side of 90. 
you'll find them walking in Matra Mandir, doing their work, being able to speak, being able to help others and so on. It also wants to be a bridge between the past and the future. So in the Pathing Naka, the basic core of what Auroville is, is based on what was the integral yoga of Sri Aurobindo and his direct action. Adala, he was somebody who spent the initial part of his life in England. He didn't want Sri Aurobindo to have any trace of Indianness. He didn't want Sri Aurobindo England at a very young age, like seven years old, until the age of 21, he did so well academically. He studied in different schools, then went to St. King, the King's College at Cambridge and, and really excelled in it. After Indian civil service, and then I joined the exams, but horse riding, he remained absent because of which he was not selected. People say that he did not join Pandratka. This was a colony of the British. And he didn't want to. He was having these thoughts in his mind and did not want to serve under the British, is what is believed. And so he chose not to take the Indian civil services where he was selected. And of course, he came back. And there, after doing a lot of, then he came back to India and worked at Baroda with the Maharaja Sayaji Rao, who was the ruler of the Gaikwad state of Baroda. And Anga, when he was there for nearly 13 years, he immersed himself in Indian culture, different languages for the first time. He learned Sanskrit, he learned Bengali, he learned different parts of our culture, meditation, and so on. And that is where he started growing. But of course, the other important point in his life was at the Alipur jail when he was imprisoned. Later, when he went to Punjab and uh, went, went to Bengal and also joined the movement following the partition of uh, Bengal and following the, the revolutionary movement there, he was actually in the Alipur bomb blast case. He was an under trial and he was in the prison. And that is where he had a very special experience. He actually experienced Sri Krishna and Kali. It is believed that Sri Vivekananda was also experienced by him. He felt his presence. And based on it, when he came out, he was already a changed man in many, many ways. And after that, when he returned back through Chandarnagar to this town of Pondicherry back then, which was a French colony. And he devoted his whole years there to a lot of internal sadhana. But basically what he has given us is based on the secret of the Vedas. That was also the title of the book that he had written. And then he had given that whole gist in a book called Life Divine. And so in the third chapter or a point, Patingnaka, Auroville wants to be the bridge between the past and the future. So the Vedic knowledge and the future and taking advantage of all discoveries from outside and from within. Auroville will boldly spring towards future realizations. And it will also be a site of material and spiritual researches and a living embodiment of an actual human unity. So this was the basis. And in the Tavara, if we look at the other aspects of uh, Auroville, we find that, uh, in fact, he had given on the day of the independence of India, 15th August, which also happened to be his birthday. It was his birthday. It also happened to be India's free independence day. And that is why on that day, uh, he gives a very spe special speech, which was telecast on All India Radio, Tiruchirapalli. So in that speech, he talks about five dreams that he has. And the first dream, he says, would be a revolutionary movement, which would create a free and united India. In fact, he also says that the partition of India also must go. He feels it will be a completely united India. The second was about the liberation of the peoples of Asia. 
and her return to a great role in the progress of human civilization. The third, fourth and fifth dreams are what have actually led to the formation of Auroville. The third was a world union forming the outer basis of a fairer, brighter and nobler life for all mankind. And the fourth was the spiritual gift of India to the world. And the fifth was the evolutionary step towards or to lead towards a higher and larger consciousness. So it's basically all of these which are to be practiced or experimented at a crucible at a location in India. And it is with that aim, and the Noka Todada, Oruvil, Nagaratha, build Pandradoda Yenna, Anna Yoda Avanga, she got it in her, it was her desire, it was her idea that the city was founded. And upon the film La Sonna Madri, she had got an architect back then who was one of the top architects of the world to actually design the entire city. And it allowed Ambadaira, Janatohe. Irupanga Abrin or and or Noka Toda Amangamuru city a design panirkanga and she wanted us and she wants us to manifest that city. So that is what we are all here for. And the city automatically, as we build the infrastructure, as we build the housing, all of it, more and more people can come. And we want to extend a special welcome invitation to all of you and all our sisters and brothers from all over India and the world to come to Oroville, to visit it, come as a volunteer, come as an intern and participate in all these activities that we're doing. So once again, we want to extend a very warm welcome to all of you to come to Oroville and thank you again for being here today. Now I will stop with this and hand it over to Manoj Pavitranji. Namaste, Vanakkam. Namaste. It's great to see when spiritual communities come together and connect and share. What I would like to share today is first of all, you have already heard the stories of Sri Aurobindo. These are the stories that really deeply move us and the reason why we are here. The reason why we are all here. So without bringing some aspects of his story, it is difficult to convey that deeper movement. And I would like to start with the year 1893. That was a very, very important year, not only for India, but also for the world. That was the day, no, that was the year when Swami Vivekananda went to Chicago and gave his famous speech at the Parliament of World Religions. It is exactly the same year Gandhiji was thrown out of a train in South Africa. 
and he decided to take on the battle that fire in him woke up with that incident such an injustice cannot be accepted and world will change third important incident is not at all known beyond your bindu and mother circle that was the year sir bindu returned to india landed in bombay and a profound spiritual experience came to him spontaneously what we may refer to as a vast calm and peace that descended upon him we know that every mantra ends with shanti 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 that's really like the foundational experience the foundation to be laid of peace vast peace and this experience came to him spontaneously when he arrived on the shores of india it was like a welcome gift from mother india to sri arabindo and that experience stayed with him and it deepened and many such experiences unfolded and one interesting thing about sri arabindo's approach to spirituality was it is it was and it is very life affirmative so he was very deeply into action he wanted freedom of the country and he was immersing in understanding indian culture and he came across yoga that to another interesting experience where his brother barin he was down with fever and a yogi came who took a glass of water did some gestures did some mantras and gave the water this fever had been lasting for quite some time and when his brother took the water fever disappeared for sri arabindo this was an indication oh if yoga can give such power i want that power to liberate the country he was into application of the power of yoga for the liberation of the country <clears throat> and he got into deep practice he was deeply into pranayama he was practicing for hours 5 to 6 hours then it came to kind of a plateau he was not able to proceed further he was stuck though he had tremendous energy great flow of inspiration poetic writings political action all that was happening but spiritually he was not able to proceed further at that time he met a maharashtrian yogi called vishnu baskar lele and it is lele he told him who told him observe thoughts will come from outside before they come and settle reject it that was a very simple instruction and sri arabindo took the instruction sat in concentration and he could see thoughts arriving and he started rejecting thoughts soon his mind became like a clear blue sky free from thoughts yoga chitta vritti nirodha that he did in 3 days and arrived deepened into the experience of nirvana and interestingly he had to give a talk 
because it was in the middle of the movement for freedom of the country and he was completely blanked out he did not know what to say but then they told him you go and stand in front of the people speech will happen and that's what exactly what he did he went there stood in front of the crowd completely emptied in a state of deep nirvana and a profound speech happened through him that incident onwards he was completely relying on that divine inspiration to speak through him to work through him guide him everything was left to that divine force no more from a mental intelligence or mental effort and struggle that was replaced by the divine action and he was deeply into the freedom struggle where he was going around giving talks meeting people and as you heard he was in the jail he was arrested and there he had another a deeper experience where it was referred to as a vasudeva experience we know in indian tradition of liberation of ascending into higher planes and dissolving into the formless on other end he was experiencing divinity involved and sustaining everything isha vasyam idam sarvam and in the form of krishna who was behind all things and he was practicing his yoga in the jail that led to that realization that immanent divine divinity in things and moving all things that's where also he had guidance from swami vivekananda who led him through a deeper experiences of ascending into higher planes of consciousness remember daji was speaking today morning about the subconscious ocean below and the superconscious ocean above and that thin layer in between he was ascending into the superconscious layers there he came across many many stratas of consciousness and he maps it meticulously and this is one of the great work that he has done in terms of a detailed mapping of the planes of consciousness that lies above the mind when the mind evolves beyond the normal strata that is available to it what are the stages of that ascension so he referred to one level as higher mind beyond that illumined mind beyond that the plane of intuition beyond that over mind and beyond that something that transcends mind all together and he referred to that as the super mind later he found the reference to it in the vedas in the vedic rishis refer to as the rhythm and the upanishadic rishis refer to that as vijnana and or mahas and in puranas also we see here mahas but then he realized that knowledge of that was relatively lost in the long history of india and by the time he came out of the jail he had his greater mission worked out for him already he saw that humanity was heading for an evolutionary crisis and freedom of india was only a step on the way and india has a great work to do for the world because at least for the last 5000 years in this country this exploration of consciousness this research into consciousness 
and how that can be operationalized in the world had been going on and that work is coming to a point where it has to reach to the world and there is a an evolutionary transition that is bound to happen on earth which has not happened so far and he was not referring to individuals liberating but a whole new species arising on earth as a result of what he referred to as the supramental consciousness coming down and becoming operational in matter on earth and that became his work and when he came to pondicherry when he left freedom struggle because he wanted to work on this and there was a clear inner guidance where he came here settled working on this ascending into those higher levels and not in a trance condition we know about samadhi nirvikalpa samadhi swapna samadhi all that but in a state of trance withdrawal from the externalities of going into deep trance ascending whereas what he was working on was how to bring that into active dynamic living condition of the body it is not even swapna samadhi or we can say in the gita's language karma samadhi in action how you establish that higher consciousness in the body as a result there is a transformation that is bound to happen eventually leading towards a new species on earth and he says though these things are implied in the yoga of the gita it is not explicitly stated it is implied whereas now time has come and we can see that on earth now in the world the mind is reaching a plateau the level of complexity that is created by our present civilization is so intricate so vast it is no more possible for the mind to understand and manage the complexity and we are likely to self destruct and a whole new being whole new consciousness in an active creative condition has to be established and that was the work he and mother his spiritual collaborator who joined him who took up and in 1956 by the time in 1950 sri aurobindo had already left his body he had already brought in this higher consciousness closer to the physical but there was strong resistance in the physical and he said i will work from the other side the subtler side of reality mother would continue from this side and he left in 1950 within 6 years mother would bring down into earth consciousness the supramental force on february 28th and that is a decisive turn in the history of earth but not known beyond sri aurobindo and mother's community because it's a subtler work happening in consciousness something that they have worked for decades finally manifesting and that was almost like disrupting the balance of earth from old to something new that will emerge and that work is going on behind the scenes on one hand we have a world that is disintegrating breaking apart pralaya of the old world and there is a whole new world that is arising and a new consciousness that is happening and within the species the higher level of consciousness is bound to manifest more and more and according to sri aurobindo and mother eventually a new species will arise on the planet and so there is this whole collapse of the old awakening and rising up of the new a whole new creation happening 
So you can see our mind will be increasingly becoming obsolete. And a higher consciousness than mind will be necessary. And in that context, to accelerate that work, already in the 60s, there was this Cold War happening. And in his five dreams, Sri Aurobindo even mentioned a catastrophe might intervene and destroy the work. But he said, even then the divine will will prevail. In, 19, in the 60s, when mother had this idea of creating Oroville, she wanted to bring in all the nations together. The reason is, there was this tremendous conflict building up, the Cold War between US and Russia, and tremendous buildup of nuclear weapons, and destruction was imminent. And she wanted to tilt that balance, and she wanted the nations to open to collaboration. And even if the scale is small, if the nations collaborate, there will be a tilt of balance of the power of destruction. So this idea of Oroville was brought forth and all the nations of the United Nations, 124 member states, agreed like a miracle. Even US and USSR came here with a handful of soil to collaborate. And on that ground, Oroville was late, but it is like a seed, a small seed. But she said, the size and the scale of action is not the important part, but the very fact that these nations are collaborating, that makes the difference. And she was planning a city for 50,000 people from all over the world. A city that is dedicated to the evolution of consciousness for human unity, a place of unending education. And there was a master plan to build a city. And she said, no rules. And this is not an ashram. You have to build a city. And you have to find ways of organizing yourself, defining your own rules as you evolve, finding a way of self-governance, sustenance, a self-sustaining city, a city with a soul. And unlike unconventional, traditional ways of building a city where we see in the town planning these days, we have economic zones that is meant to generate wealth that sustains the city life. So even in the beginning when Oroville was conceived, people were suggesting we should start industries first. Mother said, no, build Matri Mandir first the soul of the city. And that was right at the center. And the early decades of Oroville was into building of Matri Mandir, the soul of the city. And the soul is now building its body, its mind, its life, and all its commerce, everything that is unfolding. Now, how do we self-organize and evolve? How do we create a collective life that focuses on self-discovery? Apply yoga in life, where Sri Aurobindo said, all life is yoga. Everything we do in daily life is a means for spiritual progress and transformation. And how do we do that? How do we open ourselves to that karma yoga that is continuous, non-stop? It is not about only the meditation that is sitting, but how do you meditate in action? How to make action transformative? And of course, for that, the center in the heart, the divine seated in the heart, finding that forms the first condition because that connects us with the divine presence that is there in everything so that every act become a consecration to the divine. It doesn't matter what you do, taking bath, changing dress, eating meals, cooking meals, doesn't matter what. How are you making that into a consecration? 
And are you coming from that deep sense of the sacred? And how are you able to open to the divine influx, the divine shakti entering and acting through the instrument? And that became the simple process where Mother said, remember and offer. It's extremely simple on one hand. On the other side, it is very difficult because we live in forgetfulness. Waking up to that presence within and enabling every little action to be a consecration to the Divine so that we understand what Vedic Rishis were singing. Agnimi le purohita yaknasya deva ritvijam hotaram ratnadatamam that perfect order and delight, how does it manifest? And what is this Agni, this human aspiration, that longing in the heart, the will to progress, the sacred thirst? And that's not a matter of technique. And that is something that is there like growth of the plants, the trees, the awakening of a seed. Everywhere this fire is working through and it is working through us to progress. So opening ourselves to that will to progress, that thirst to grow into that divine nature. And when that call from below moves our actions, grace from above is bound to come. And as Daji was referring to, the rain from above. But how receptive are we? How do we prepare ourselves to be receptive to the grace that is pouring down into the instrument. So hum comes cleansing, purification of all the instruments so that we are receptive to the grace that is pouring in and we can become the willing servitors of the divine consciousness. And how do we prepare a whole society towards this? How to transform our education system towards this? How do we transform our healthcare system towards it? How do we transform our economic system towards it? How do we transform our governance system towards this? And this is a lab. And it is a prototype in the making. And we are not the scientists. We are the guinea pigs. The Divine is the scientist who is working through all, manifesting something to which our little mind is unable to really grasp. But the more it becomes silent, the more we become peaceful, the more we can open to the vast action of a higher consciousness that is omnipresent, omniscient, omnipotent and that is acting through all but we need deep quietude to be receptive and it can move and it can transform our human nature into divine nature and so that is the process and each one is left to find in their own way and perfection of integral yoga is when each person find their own unique way of opening to that presence, that force, that guides, leads, transforms. Thank you. Any questions, I will be happy to take up. We have a few more minutes. So when you said uh, around 50,000 people are planning to live in Aravel, so what are the steps taken by Aravel towards that? So far, Aravel had been building its ground 
regenerating the soil. But in terms of outreach to attract people, it was never done. It is like when flower blooms, bees would come. Though unfortunately, only around 3,300 bees have come so far. And uh, from 60 countries, we need to create conditions that attract more people. And we are still figuring out how to do that, especially, say, when you have a living spiritual master. When mother was there, things were very easy. It was pouring in. In the absence of a spiritual master living here, this became a question of ordinary human nature trying to figure out in their own way, in our own way, in our own limited way. And figuring out even the 3,300, how do you live in harmony? Now, before we bring in bigger influx, that itself is a challenge when each one is coming with their own luggage, their own difficulties. You know that even within a given family, how difficult it is to create harmony. So imagine people from all over the world with such diverse culture coming together. So there is a, in a way, battleground. Karmakshetre, Kurukshetre, there is a battle happening. Number of people who are willing to join, we are waiting. And the conditions of the game here is fundamentally different. There is no private property. Nobody can own any land. No one can have any asset. If you are starting a business, creating wealth, it doesn't belong to you. It belongs to the divine. And having the courage to drop the past and jump into that fire and give yourself to the adventure of the unknown where you have no safety belt. You have to find a way. And we have, as of now, 3,300 people. We hope, we pray, we request Mother, send them. Probably many of you might get inspired. Most welcome. But it is an adventure. There is no shortcut. Only the true spiritual consciousness will attract the right people. Why I ask the question? No, because even I born here, but I know very limited uh, about the uh, Aravel. Even the residents here, no, in around Pondicherry, even they are very limited knowledge about the ashram. Even we live within uh, around ashram, so we see something like no, they, these people are something like aliens. So we are something different, local. So something people should we should yeah. think. Yeah. One of the differences. There is no fixed technique and method prescribed by Mother and Sri Aurobindo that everyone practices, something that can be scaled up. They have established a force that is doing its work, and each individual has to find their own way of transformation. There are fundamental principles that are common that makes it very difficult for people to understand Often people read Mother and Shri or and say, what is the method? How do I practice? I don't know. And this is a challenge. And uh, we need to do work in that area to make Sri Aurobindo more accessible. And find ways of conveying that you can convert every little activity into a practice so that more and more people learn the art of integral karma yoga. And it's not a technique. Again, that's a challenge. But there is work to do there. And we are working towards that. And uh, yes, I hope this reaches out, attracts the right people. Namaste and thank you for the introduction and the deep aspect also. I was uh, wanted to know in a Norwegian's life, how is how does the community, sense of community manifest? Do you have things that you do together or some satsang or place where you eat together or something like this? Where is the where does the community manifest in Every day's life. 
the center of it is mother and shri arbindo love for them connection for them that unifies everyone holds everyone together in spite of all the differences then in terms of practically coming together and experiencing in the early decades it was building of matri mandir working together concreting digging the soil and parallelly digging the earth planting trees that is satsang and that's karma yoga and well when you work together that's where all the differences show up and uh, it's very easy to come together meditate and we do have people who ever wants to create group meditations come together do that relatively easy but when you take up a project work on it that's when the ego shows up and that's where the boundaries that are well hidden shows up and in that you it is even though it is painful it doesn't look as pleasant as singing bhajans or sitting and meditating but that's where the ego boundaries get exposed and you become more and more self aware and transformation happens and of course there are places like solar kitchen which is our largest community kitchen where we eat together and there are many community kitchens many art events many all types of collective events are happening where we meet but it is in work really the deep bonds are made and when you go through the challenges because oroville is a place full of challenges and that's when the the cracks in consciousness the gaps in consciousness get become visible and there is nowhere to hide you're naked of your own limitations and you see it okay this has to be worked on we are not able to sit together and talk to each other okay let me take a deep breath let's find a way it doesn't look very pleasant but that's where we build the true foundation thank you any other question please i don't think there is actually any individual work in orville just show one work people think that i am an individual doing it <laughs> where is it <laughs> if you kind of want to come out of your house and put yourself into one of the thing as a, partic- a participant or kind of contribution to the community then again it is a contribution to the whole community there isn't any individual work here inge thani manida vela enbadu edhume kadaiyadu enna irukkeenga நீங்கள் உங்கள் வீட்டை விட்டு வெளியே வந்து ஒரு சமூக பணிக்காக தான் வெளியே வர முடியும் சமூக அந்த அர்ப்பணிப்புக்காக தான் வெளியே வர முடியும் தனி மனித வேலையே கிடையாதுங்கள உங்களுடைய திறனுக்கு ஏற்ப நீங்கள் அதில் போய் ஹூக்க பண்ணிக்கிறீங்க அதுதான் முடியும் இந்த தனி மற்றபடி இங்கே தனி மனித திறன் அதில் பயன்படுதே தவிர அவர்களுங்கிறது ஒரு சமூகமாக தான் முழுக்க முழுக்க சங்கமிக்குது அதுதான் தனி மனித வேலையா நடக்கல ஐம் ஜஸ்ட் எக்ஸ்பிளைனிங் தட் தெர் இஸ் நத்திங் யூ குட் மூவ் ஆஸ் அன் இண்டிவிஜுவல் ஹியர் எனி திங் தட் யூ வாண்ட் கம் அவுட் ஆஃப் யுவர் ஹவுஸ் அண்ட் ஜஸ்ட் பட் யுவர் ஃபீட் இட் பிகம்ஸ் அ கம்யூனிட்டி இட்ஸ் ஆஃப் கலெக்டிவ் யோகா யூ டூ இட் ஃபார் எவ்ரி ஒன் வேற ஏதாவது கேள்விகள் is there any restriction that only this number of people should come from a country like that no there is no such restrictions and uh, the, is there any specific practice which can take people to super conscious levels as i was explaining simple things like remember and offer your work work as worship though these are there are hundreds of such simple practices given it is up to each individual to take up even just one and go deep and there is no uh, formal demand on individuals to you must practice this or that it is in, this is a place where individual liberty is maximized and it is allowed for you to find your own way struggling your or stumbling your way through make mistakes but learn from the mistake because this place 
demands individuals who are individualized. That is, you have become a strong individual. You are able to think for yourself. And the soul is individualized. So that space of individual liberty is very important for people to find their own method. So there is nothing that is common for everyone. Uh, there is a common belief that uh, the practice has to be done every day in a given time, in a given amount of time. Only then, and that too uh, guided by a, a master, uh, there will be a, a, a sustainable growth, a sustainable development or a, a promotion rather to higher levels. Right. There is a common belief in India. In every system there is a belief that there should be a practice and that should be practiced every day in a given time. Given time. Yes, non-stop. That's why Sri Aurobindo says all life is yoga. Everything that you do must be done from that perspective. One can do things mechanically. Even one can do puja, bhajans, everything mechanically. It will not have effect. What makes the difference is the conscious aspiration behind the action. So you once you become conscious and you need to develop it individually and it cannot be brought from outside. Yeah. So every act as you become more and more conscious become a consecration. Yeah, we do call that as a constant remembrance. In remembrance of uh, the higher consciousness, uh, we have to do all this karma. But uh, in addition to that, we have practices also. Anyway, uh, just yes, for starting. It is, it is required, especially to establish and begin our ground, forming our ground. Group practices are good. For example, I have a group of people with which, whom we work. And what we found is when you practice together as a group, it is 10 times more effective than yeah. trying to do alone. And so group practice together. But you have a wide palette of options because each individual is at a different stage of growth. And according to the requirement of that individual, we need to customize it. And those who are practicing similar practices come together and do it together and that accelerates tremendously. Thank That's you. how we are exploring it. Thank you. Maybe it's time for lunch. <laughs> Uh, brother, good afternoon, brother. <clears throat> what is the ultimate goal of this uh, integral yoga? We, you know, we, here we have no any living guru. What is the ultimate uh, aim and goal of the integral yoga, brother, here? An integral union with the divine. Not only in the formless, but in the very matter itself. All the way, across the spectrum. Then whatsoever the divine does, that's the right thing. Is it, uh, is it a difficult without a living guru doing this such a practice? Sri Aurobindo is alive and present <laughs> everywhere in every particle of this place. Mother is present everywhere. The, only the body has disappeared. It's not visible to us. But it is our common experience. Whenever we run into any difficulty, when there is a deep call, there is a direct intervention, help that happens. And it is our common experience. So it is not that they are gone and not available, they are present. But of course, someone who has embodied that consciousness and that presence, physical presence always helps. But it is left to the individual to find with whom you want to associate with. <laughs> 